Good morning, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the opening ceremony of the 7th UN WTO Global Summit on Urban Tourism. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Lee Ju Hee, and it is a great honor and privilege to serve as your MC today. Thank you. During the summit, 900 academics and policy specialists will come together to share case studies and explore with global scholars on ways to address the major issues that global cities face, such as the emerging fourth industrial revolution and sustainable tourism. We hope you will find your time here in Seoul personally and professionally rewarding and enjoyable. And underlining the importance of this conference, today we have many distinguished guests joining us. At this time, please allow me to introduce the guest of honor. First, we have Mr. Jura Polari Kashvili, the Secretary General of UNWTO, joining us. Thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you, sir. And next, we have Mr. Shin Wan Char, Chair of Seoul Metropolitan Council, joining us as well. And next, we have Mr. Do Jong Hwan, the Minister of Culture, Sports, and Tourism of the Republic of Korea, joining us. And next, Mr. Joseph Fine, the co founder of Strategic Horizons, our keynote speaker. Welcome, sir. And next, all the way from Greece, we have Elena Kondra, the Minister of Tourism, joining us. And next, Mr. Chedungbat Namsrai, the Minister of Environment and Tourism of Mongolia, is also here today. Thank you. And Ahmed bin Nasar Al Mahij, the Minister of Tourism of Oman, is also here with us today. And we also have mayors joining us. Mr. Ashok Banju from the city of Dulikel of Nepal is also joining us. Yes, welcome. And we also have Mr. Mato Frankovic uh, from Croatia. He is the mayor of Duvorinik. And we also have uh, Mayor Elias Luiwako of Kampala, city of Kampala from Uganda, uh, joining us as well. Welcome. And we have Mayor Mohammad Amin Nouril Abdul Aziz from the city of Kuala Lumpur of Malaysia joining us. Thank you, sir. And we have many uh, distinguished guests joining us this morning, but I would like to ask for your kind understanding that due to time constraints, we are not able to introduce each and every one of you. But once again, on behalf of our host, I would like to extend a very warm welcome and our deepest gratitude to all of you joining us here this morning. And there is one a special guest that I have not introduced yet. Ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, please join me in welcoming His Excellency Park Won Soon, the Mayor of Seoul Metropolitan City, to the stage for his welcoming remarks. So now we would like to invite uh, Mayor Park to the stage uh, for his welcoming remarks. Uh, he has given us his unsparing uh, support in organizing uh, the UNWTO Global Summit. So please, once again, welcome him with a warm round of applause. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Seoul. I am Wonsun Park Mayor of Seoul. 여기까지만 영어로 말씀드리고요. 네, 아, 여러분 대한민국의 아, 2000년 역사 도시 서울, 또 어, 전통 전통과 미래가 공존하는 도시, 예, 그리고 24시간 불이 꺼지지 않는 잠들지 않는 도시, 역동적인 도시 서울에 방문해 주신 여러분. 환영합니다. 오늘 이 자리는 세계 곳곳에서 정말로 귀한 분들이 많이 오셨습니다. 먼저 본 행사를 공동으로 주최하고 있는 UN WTO 사무총장님 주랍 폴로리스 카슈빌리 총장님 그리고 한국 정부를 대표해서 참석해 주신 도종환 문화체육관광부 장관님 그리고 우리 서울시 신원철 시의회 의장님 
감사드립니다. 그리고 어, 세계 50개 국가에서 방문해 주신 글로벌 관광 리더 여러분 어, 진심으로 환영합니다. 그리고 국내외 관광업계 여러분들도 많이 참석해 주셨습니다. 다시 한번 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 어, 그리고 또이 자리에는 세계 여러 도시의 시장님들 또 주한 외교사절 대사님들이 많이 참석해 주고 계십니다. 다시 한번 감사의 말씀을 전합니다. 서울시는 UNWTO와 함께 2030 세계 도시관광 미래 비전을 주제로 해서 제7차 세계 관광 총회를 개최하게 된 것을 대단히 영광스럽게 생각합니다. 여러분 잘 아시다시피 관광 산업은 미래 산업입니다. 전 세계 GDP의 10%가 바로 이 관광 산업에서 나옵니다. UNWTO에 따르면 국제 관광객이 2017년에 약 13억 명에서 2030년이 되면 18억 명이 이를 것이라고 예상하고 있습니다. 관광은 도시가 축적해온 문화에 모든 것을 공유하는 산업으로 경제적 가치는 물론이고 문화적 발전에도 기여도가 높습니다. 또 많은 사람들에게 영감을 주고 자신의 인생을 전환하는 그런 계기가 되기도 합니다. 서울시는 2013년 관광 마스터 플랜을 수립해서 지속적으로 관광 산업을 육성해 왔습니다. 그 결과 세계에서 일곱 번째로 관광객이 많은 해외 관광객이 많이 찾는 도시이고 또 3년 연속 세계 3위의 마이스 도시가 되었습니다. 회의하기 좋은 도시 세계 1위이고요. 또 가장 어, 많은 부자여행객들이 즐겨 찾는 도시 세계 1위입니다. 서울시는 이러한 양적 성장을 넘어서서 이제 질적 성장을 위해서 도약하고자 합니다. 어, 서울시는 보다 지속가능한 도시의 발전을 위해서 재생, 사람, 협치라고 하는 이세 가지 키워드로 어, 미래 관광을 이끌고자 합니다. 서울은 오랜 역사의 역사와 문화에 새로운 가치를 부여하는 재생 서울을 방문하는 누구라도 관광시민으로 어, 서울을 누리도록 하는 사람 민관은 물론이고 국내외 도시와 협력해서 서울이 지향하는 가치를 실현하는 협치 바로 이것입니다 미래의 관광시장 변화에 대해서 서울시를 비롯해서 각계각청에서 고민하고 있습니다 관광시장이 지속가능한 성장을 이루기 위해서는 기술의 변화, 또 정치사회적 변화, 기후변화 이런 급격한 소용돌이 속에서 정확히 트렌드를 예측하고 또 거기에 부응하는 일이 중요합니다. 이번 행사는 관광시장의 주요 이슈에 대해서 국가와 도시 그리고 비영리기구와 다국적 기업 등 여러 분야의 식견과 통찰력을 모으기 위해서입니다. 체험경제의 관점에서 도시관광의 미래 해법을 밝혀줄 조셉 파인 박사의 기조연설 그리고 17개 국가 도시 기관 대표들의 미래 관광을 논의하는 고위급 라운테이블 그리고 미래 경쟁력, 4차 산업혁명, 도시, 도시재생 그리고 공정, 공정관광을 주제로 한 4개의 세션에서 굉장히 풍요로운 풍성한 논의를 기대합니다. 오늘 이 자리에서 열기를 보니까 앞으로 관광산업의 미래가 여러분 밝죠? 네 대답이 좀더 컸으면 좋겠습니다. 네 서울시는 이번 행사를 계기로 해서 도시관광의 발전을 선도하고 또 도시간 협력체계를 구축하기 위해서 노력하겠습니다. 여러분 참잘 오셨습니다. 높고 푸른 서울의 가을 하늘이 여러분을 반기고 있습니다. Actually, from now on, Seoul is, uh, you know, making the most beautiful season, autumn. It's becoming more colorful and beautiful. Please extend your stay for one more month. <laughs> Thank you very much. Enjoy your stay here in Seoul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. We were able to learn about the efforts and accomplishments of uh, Seoul Metropolitan City, and I'm sure that many of you are looking forward to learning more about Seoul City's experiences. 
Next, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in inviting the Secretary General of the World Tourism Organization, His Excellency Mr. Jura Polari Kashvili, to the stage for his opening remarks. He will officially declare the opening of the summit. Please welcome the Secretary General with a warm round of applause. Maybe we will stay all autumn here in winter. We like so much your wonderful city and it's a pleasure to be in Seoul. Uh, dear ministers, dear vice ministers, mayors, vice mayors, ambassadors, dear friends, dear all. First of all, I want to greet our dear minister, Dr. Jong Hwan, for his kind hospitality and thank you for your hospitality and for your helping to bring this conference to Seoul. I commend the Korean government, your ministry, and Korea Tourism Organization for your support and strong commitment to promote tourism as key to sustainable development. UNWT is very pleased tourism remains a high political priority of your country. Uh, dear my Mayor, uh, Mr. Park Won Son, and Chairman of Seoul Metropolitan uh, Council, Mr. Shin Won Chel. Thank you again for your welcoming us to the exciting city of Seoul. Uh, Seoul is a pioneer in many urban tourism development initiatives. You show the world that balancing traditional values with innovation is possible. Uh, it is the perfect place for this conference and we are glad to be here. Uh, dear Mayor, you are so humble, but I want to everybody to know that uh, Mayor Park was announced and uh, nominated by Guardian like a most innovative, a number one innovative mayor in the world. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the seventh UNW.TO Global Summit on Urban Tourism. Urban tourism is becoming one of the most important topics of, in our sector. As you know, UNWTO is now focusing on innovation and digital transformation in tourism. Cities play a crucial role in this transformation and urban tourism is a catalyst for innovation. We must ensure that urban tourism is aligned with the role of cities in the global agenda. This is our responsibility as the United Nations Agency promoting tourism for sustainable development and supporting the United Nations new urban agenda. Seoul is a technological advanced and highly innovative city. This is the perfect background to discuss a 2030 uh, vision for urban tourism. The vision must be innovative, maximize the value of tourism, urban development, and consider the biggest challenges the urban tourists face today. The biggest challenge is probably managing growing tourist flows and the impact of cities and residents. Many call this over tourism or tourismophobia. Today, over half of us live in urban areas. By 2050, it will reach 70%. So the growing number of urban tourists adds already existing pressure on natural resources, infrastructure and mobility, but also on residents. Urban tourism can only be sustainable if it benefits visitors and residents alike. Engaging communities, managing Conjunctions, reducing seasonality, diversifying the products, and planning carefully are all part of solution. All of this opens doors for opportunities. Today, tourists look for authentic experiences. Goods and services are no longer enough. Experiences are driving business innovation and economic and job growth. We must adopt our policies, operations, and marketing to reflect the value of tourism experiences and the role of host communities. The all addressing these challenges is complex. We need sustainable roadmap and we need to position tourism in the wider urban agenda. We need a shared vision on urban tourism between public and private stakeholders and civil society. The key lies in combining innovation, digital transformation and sustainability. This vision will allow tourism to grow and benefit cities and societies furthermore than most other economic sectors. This vision will allow us to build a city of all 
residents and visitors. Next January in Lisbon, UNWTO will launch a new initiative called Mayors for Inclusive Tourism. And of course, all of you are invite, most than invited and we will be very glad to have you uh, in Lisbon uh, next January. We wish to bring together mayors, ministers of tourism and private sector to create dialogue and action to tourism can contribute to the sustainable cities of the culture. I want to once thank all of you to be with us uh, attending this very important uh, conference, very important summit, and wish you all the best. Nice stay in Seoul, enjoy Seoul, and have a fruitful and successful summit. Thank you very much. Kamzamida. Kamzamida. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General for your meaningful words and for eloquently setting uh, the framework for the discussions that will take place over the course of the next two days. Next, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in inviting Mr. Shin Won Char, the chair of the Seoul Metropolitan City Council. He will deliver his congratulatory remarks. Please welcome Chair Min Shin with a warm round of applause. Chilcha,世界,都市,看看,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,穷,
그리스 관광부 장관님을 비롯한 세계 각국의 장관님, 차관님, 시장님, 대표단 여러분 그리고 내외 기빈 여러분께 깊은 감사의 인사를 드립니다. 이번 총회의 주제는 2030 미래 도시 관광입니다. UN WTO에 따르면 2030년 세계 여행자 수는 약 18억 명에 이를 것이라고 합니다. 다섯 명 중에 한 명이 여행을 하는 셈이죠. 하지만 미래 관광은 재화의 소유와 공유, 자연 자원의 보호 등의 문제에서 많은 과제에 직면에 있습니다. 기회가 될지 위기가 될지는 우리의 선택에 달려 있습니다. 이제 도시는 여행자에게 어떠한 가치를 어떻게 제공할 것인지 관광산업을 통해 지역주민에게 어떠한 수입과 부가가치가 돌아가게 할 것인지를 고민해야 합니다. 우리는 도시관광지가 지불하는 비용이 창출하는 가치보다 많은 경우를 종종 보았습니다. 이번 총회에서는 도시관광의 지속가능한 성장을 위한 심도 있는 논의가 이루어지기를 희망합니다. 여행자에게는 만족할 만한 경험을 제공하면서 그 도시의 경제, 사회, 문화적 혜택을 극대화하고 환경과 문화적 악 영향은 최소화할 수 있는 전략을 마련할 수 있기를 기대합니다. 아울러 총회를 계기로 우리나라를 찾아주신 모든 분들이 대한민국 서울에 숨어있는 매력과 가치를 발견하는 여행을 즐기시기를 바랍니다. 그리고 아름다운 대한민국의 가을빛이 여러분 인생에서 행복한 기억으로 남기를 기원합니다. 고맙습니다. Thank you very much, Minister, for your warm words of welcome. Uh, next, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to commemorate the opening of the 7th UNWTO Global Summit on Urban Tourism, we are now going to have a group photo session. Uh, I know that there are many distinguished guests joining us, but at this time, uh, we ask for your kind understanding. We will invite only the ministers, vice ministers, mayors, vice mayors, ambassadors, speakers, and panelists of the high-level panel uh, to the group photo session. So please uh, come forward and uh, take your places on the stage. Uh, for the other participants, we kindly ask you to remain in your seats for a few more minutes uh, while we conduct the group photo session. And once the group photo session is over, we have a keynote speech session. So please, uh, we hope you will look forward to the keynote speech. Uh, please remain in your seats for a few more minutes uh, while we conduct the group photo session. So the gentleman who is raising his hand, 저기, 저기 사진 작가님 손한 번만 들어주세요. He is our official photographer, so please uh, look into his camera. If you are ready, uh, please face our official photographer and big smiles for our camera. So in Korea, we say kimchi. So on the count of three, if you can all smile and say kimchi. So one, two, three, kimchi. And smile brightly for our cameras. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, please give everyone here another big round of applause for their support in hosting the 7th UNWTO Global Summit on Urban Tourism. So why don't we give everyone here a big round of applause. I would like to ask the distinguished guests to join us. So once again, a big round of applause for everyone. 네, 다 함께 박수 부탁드립니다. 네, all right, thank you very much. You may return to your seats. Thank you. Once uh, everyone is seated, we will move on to the next uh, keynote speech session. The keynote speaker is Mr. Pine. He is the author of the bestseller, The Experience Economy, and is known for first using the term uh, to describe the major shift and the motivation for people to undertake many economic activities, including travel. So once everyone is seated, we will move on to the next part of our program. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a great pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker. 
An internationally acclaimed author, speaker, and management advisor to Fortune 500 companies, Mr. Joseph Fine worked at IBM for 13 years in the 1980s and was a visiting scholar with the MIT Design Lab and a visiting professor at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, today, he is currently a visiting scholar of Columbia University. Uh, many of you might have read his books. He is the author of many bestsellers, including The Experience Economy, Work is Theater and Every Business a Stage, and Authenticity, What Consumers Really Want. Ladies and gentlemen, the title of his keynote speech today is Urban Tourism in Today's Experience Economy. Please welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Joseph Fine, with a warm round of applause. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that introduction and that welcome. And uh, normally I would say what a pleasure it is to be with you, but today it is more than a pleasure, it is an honor uh, to be with so many distinguished leaders in the tourism industry, which is the number one industry in today's experience economy. So I would like to talk about what is going on with urban tourism in today's experience economy, but to understand what's going on today and into the future, we need to understand the past as well. So let me start by talking about how we, the, the economy used to be based off of commodities, the things we grow in the ground, pull in the ground, and raise in the ground, you know, animal, mineral, vegetable, and we extract them out of the ground and sell them to, uh, in the open marketplace. Commodities were the basis of the agrarian economy that lasted for millennia. Thanks to the Industrial Revolution and particularly the creation of the system of mass production over 100 years ago, we shifted into an industrial economy where goods became the predominant economic offering. We used commodities as the raw material to make or manufacture goods, physical things that we touch and feel. In the latter half of the 20th century, we shifted into a service economy where services became the predominant economic offering, where services were what consumers wanted. And services used goods as raw material to deliver a set of intangible activities on behalf of an individual person. Well, today, in the 21st century, as I'm sure you all know, we've gone beyond goods and services, and we've entered an experience economy an economy where experiences are the predominant economic offering, where experiences are what consumers want today, where experiences are where growth in GDP and jobs are going to come from now and into the future. And experiences are basically when you use goods as props and services as the stage to engage each and every individual in an inherently personal way and create that memory which is the hallmark of the experience. So the experience economy is where we have shifted economically. Here's another way to look at it, to recognize that each one of these is built on top of the earlier offerings, and each one of them have always been around. It's not that, that commodities are ever going to go away or stop employing any people or goods or services for that matter, but they will employ fewer and fewer people in the future as they get automated and as value increases and goes up into the experience. One of the things that, that happens is the shift is that goods and services are being commoditized, meaning they're treated like a commodity where people don't care who makes them, they don't care about the brand, they don't care about the features, they're all pretty much the same anyway. They come to care about three things and three things only, price, price, and price. Right? That's when goods and services have been commoditized. And that's why we need to shift around the world into the experience economy, why we need to understand that this is what consumers want today. And this is how value is being created today is increasingly through experiences. You can see this in any industry, but if you look in particular, <coughs> excuse me, at the coffee industry, as you know, the coffee at its core is what? Right? Coffee is a commodity, it's beans that you grow in the ground. And if you look at the commodity price of coffee converted from a per bushel to a per cup basis, you know how much coffee costs per cup when you treat it as a commodity? Two or three US cents. That's what coffee is worth. That's what coffee beans are worth. But if you take those beans, you roast them, 
you grind them, you package them, you put them on a grocery store shelf, now you get 5, 10, 15 cents per cup of coffee. If you take those beans and you actually perform the service of brewing them for a customer in a vending machine, a corner diner, a bodega, uh, you know, 7-Eleven convenience store somewhere, now you get 50 cents, dollar, dollar and a half per cup of coffee. But surround the brewing of the coffee with the ambiance and theater of, say, a Starbucks, and now how much are you paying? Three, four, five US dollars, right? With only two or three cents worth of beans in it. Right? That's how economic value progresses, where at each stage we create more value because we provide more of what consumers want. And of course, the price we pay for a cup of coffee at Starbucks is not just for the coffee itself, not just for the beans. It's for the time that we spend in the place. It's for the theater that it takes to create that cup of coffee. It's for the customization of that coffee just for us. In fact, a way to think about this progression of economic value, and, and between every one of them, we can draw a line and look at the various distinctions between them. And given our time today, I just want to talk about one key distinction between services and experiences. The, the most important distinction to understand is time. That it's about time. That services, in fact, are about time well saved. That we save people's time. Instead of having to do it themselves and spend their time, we do it for them. And we want it to be nice and easy and convenient. We want to save customers as much time as possible. Why? Well, it's so we can spend that hard-earned time and our hard-earned money on the experiences that we enjoy. And what experiences are about is time well spent. That you provide time well spent. In every urban tourism situation, what tourists are looking for is that, they, that you give them time well spent, that they value the time, that they look back on it, and the memories that they have with us say, yes, that was valuable time. I'm glad I did that. So you need to think about this aspect of time and provide not just time well saved, but time well spent for each one of your individual tourists. That's why you see tourism destinations like this uh, particular hotel resort, the Kahala, talk about time is precious, right? Spend it graciously, right? That's what they want to do. They want to provide gracious time. What is the kind of time that you want to provide to your tourists in your destination? Now, time is so important that you need to think about the fact that you are what you charge for. As an organization, as a destination, you are what you charge for. If you charge for undifferentiated stuff, you're in the commodities business. If you charge for tangible things, you're in the goods business. If you charge for the activities your people perform, you're in the services business. But what puts you in the experience business economically is charging for time. That you charge an admission fee, or a membership fee, or some other way of charging people for the time they spend with you, because that's what they value. And what happens in any one of these economic situations is that companies and organizations will give away the next level of value in order to better sell what they have today. And we need to recognize that eventually we have to align what we sell with what our customers value. And that means charging for time, charging for admission. You wouldn't go to a movie and not expect to pay an admission fee. You wouldn't go to a sporting event or a theme park or a concert or a play or a, a nightclub or any other of myriad experience venues that are out there without paying admission. Why? Because you recognize it's an experience. In the same way, we need to recognize that our urban environments are experiences. The tourist destinations are, as a whole, experiences. And then we need to begin to charge for the time that customers spend. The first tourism destination I ever saw that actually charged admission was, in fact, a 17-mile drive in Pebble Beach. 17-mile right, drive 
is what I think the most, one of the most beautiful places in the entire world in Pebble Beach, California. And people will come and they'll spend two or three hours to drive that 17 miles, getting out every once in a while to view the wonderful coastline, to see the lone cypress tree, for example. Here is the iconic element of, of Pebble Beach. And today, they, they, Pebble Beach charges over $10 per vehicle, not per person, but per vehicle, as an admission fee to 17-mile drive. And that $10 allows them to preserve it for future generations. It gives them the wherewithal to create a great experience destination. Now, we see it also increasingly in more urban environments, in more cities. Uh, Wuzhen, China, for example, is the first one I've seen that charges admission to get into the city center, into two different tourist districts that they have. They charge 150 renminbi, which is about uh, 20 US dollars, 22 euros, for that admission fee into the center, right? And what does it do? It sends a signal that this is a place worth experiencing. That's what admission fees do. And again, they give you the wherewithal to be able to create a great experience, to preserve that experience for future generations, to, to uh, refresh and enhance the experience. It is so important. And without that admission fee, it's very difficult to have the funds to be able to do that. And I think it's particularly important in urban environments. So, so many times, right, I've only, I've only been talking with people in this conference for the last 24 hours, and so many times I've heard people talk about the overcrowding of tourism. Right? It's one of the big problems is that tourism destinations are becoming overcrowded. Well, there's a simple solution to that. Charge people to go. <laughs> Right? The more you charge, the fewer people you're going to get. And you can use that as a lever to be able to get down to the amount of people that it makes sense for your tourism destination to, to have. Think about congestion pricing, right? such as Singapore has and London and other places. Right? Instead of charging for congestion, just change it around. Say what this is is a charge as an admission fee for the city center experience. And then people will gladly pay it, as opposed to grumbling and complaining about paying it. Because they understand that it is an experience for them to get to be in the, in, in, in the city center. So think about how you can charge for your destination. There are only a few examples of tourist destinations doing that today. But more and more in the future, that's exactly what's going to happen. Right? Now tourism, as has already been mentioned today, Right, according to the UNWTO, is already 10% of the world's GDP. It's, it employs 10% of the world's population is in tourism because it's the number one industry in today's experience economy. But what's happening is because we're shifting the experience economy, I mean, tourism has always been experience, but now everybody else is getting into the experience business as well. You no longer have the experience business to yourself. Right? Manufacturers are getting into the experience business. Retailers are getting into the experience business. Everybody, hotels, restaurants, and so forth are getting into the experience business so that you are now competing against the world. Right? You're competing against the world for the currencies of the experience economy. And that's time, as we mentioned, attention, and money. Right? Time, attention, and money are the currencies of the experience economy. And time is limited. We can only experience things 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? It's a very limited amount of time that we have as human beings on this earth. But if somebody does capture my time and I'm spending my time with them, whether it's another tourist destination, whether it's a retailer, a manufacturer, whatever it might be, what am I not doing? I'm not spending that time with you. In the same way, attention is increasingly scarce in today's media fragmented world. And if somebody does capture my attention because of the experience they create, get me to spend my time with them, then what am I not doing is I'm not giving that attention to you. And finally, money is consumable. Right? If I have a dollar or a euro or a won or whatever to spend, if I spend that with some other company in some other industry in some other geographic uh, area, what can't I do with that money? I can't spend it with you. It's gone. It's consumed. All of these are limited. So you need to understand the basic principle of the experience economy is that the experience is the marketing. 
the experience is the marketing, that the best way to generate demand for your destination is with an experience so engaging that customers can't help but spend their time with you, give you their attention, and then spend their money as a result. So you need to stage marketing experience. You need to stage experiences that generate demand for your particular offerings. For example, a number of years ago, uh, Lapland in Rovaniemi, Finland, they created a snow and ice exhibit where they brought snow and ice from Lapland down into southern Europe during the summer, right, where people do not get experience snow and ice. And it's such a unique thing that it generates demand for people to want to go to Lapland, where snow and ice isn't, a, isn't something that's, that, that's bad. It's a draw to be able to, uh, to come there. Uh, or uh, think about what New Zealand has been able to do simply because of the Lord of the Rings movies. Right? I've been to New Zealand a couple of times myself, and of course I had to go to Hobbiton. I had to experience it for myself uh, there, and it's a tremendous draw. Uh, their, their, their Ministry of Tourism actually took on the title of Ministry of Lord of the Rings as well for a while because of that tremendous draw. And you see it in cities and urban environments as well. In fact, you know, the number one tourist destination in, in uh, all of Ireland is the Guinness Storehouse. Right? Again, a manufacturer of beer that wanted to create a distinctive marketing experience for its product. So created this Guinness Storehouse and this beautiful facility and an old uh, uh, distillery that it had there where people paid an admission fee to learn about Guinness beer, how grain is grown and turned into beer, the, what, what makes a Guinness a Guinness and so forth. And this gets over a million visitors per year paying admission to learn about Guinness. And at the same time generates over 100,000 new pints of beer every year. Right? Actually new, new uh, drinkers of Guinness every year out of that million uh, with over 20 million more pints a year sold because of this one experience. And in fact, the Guinness storehouse has basically become an icon for the entire city. It's become a marker for the city. If you Google tu uh, tourism on Google Images, like I did here, you will see many images like you see here. And what is this, basically? It's, it, as you see this airplane going around the world, you see all the different markers for all the different tourist destinations, or at least many of them around the world. Every tourist destination becomes known by its marker there, such as the Namsung Seoul Tower here in, uh, in Korea. As what do markers do is like an admission fee, they send a signal that this is the place worth experiencing. Something that becomes known worldwide, that draws people, that that marker becomes an experience unto itself, one that generates demand for your particular uh, destination. A marker was actually coined by Dean McCannell in his famous book, The Tourist. Right? A wonderful book where he talks about how the, usually the first contact a sightseer has with a site is not with the site itself, it's with a representation of it. It's with a marker for the experience. That's particularly true as more and more of our first sites are online where we see those markers. And uh, McCannell says that the problem of modernizing areas seeking to attract tourists is not the absence of sites. We all have sites, right? It's the absence of a fully developed system of site markers with worldwide extension, right? And what markers are are places, places that people want to experience. You think about what are your markers and, and how authentic those markers are to your places increasingly important. In fact, authenticity is incredibly important in today's experience economy. In fact, authenticity is the new consumer sensibility. It's the primary buying criterion by which they choose who to buy from and what to buy. And basically, it's because as life becomes more and more of a paid-for experience, people increasingly question, well, what is real and what is not? And increasingly, people don't want the fake from the phony. They want the real from the genuine. So you have to manage this perception of authenticity of your urban tourist destinations and get people to perceive you as authentic. But what so many destinations do is they, in fact, render themselves inauthentic. Why? Because often because they're proclaiming their authenticity. 
You know, every island in the Caribbean says, this is the authentic Caribbean. No, this is the authentic Caribbean. No, this is the authentic Caribbean. You don't want to proclaim yourselves to be authentic. Because when you say you're authentic, people will immediately doubt that authenticity. Right? That's not the way to do it. Instead, what you need to do is you need to understand what we call the Polonius test. The Polonius test, of course, comes from William Shakespeare's play Hamlet, that most existential of plays, where Polonius is perhaps the most fake character uh, in the entire play. But there's one point where he's giving this long series of advice to his son Laertes, and it's platitude after platitude and cliche after cliche until the very end, Polonius, or rather Shakespeare through Polonius, says something very profound. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Now, in those three lines of the immortal bard are the two key standards of authenticity. Number one, being true to self. We all recognize that. That's what authenticity is about, is being true to self. But don't forget the third line. The third line about not being false to any man that's not about the self to which you must be true. It's about how you represent yourself. And the question is, do you represent yourself in truth or in falsehood? In other words, are you what you say you are? So the first key standard of authenticity is being true to self. And the most important element there is to understand your heritage. Right? Every tourist destination has a deep heritage. You need to figure out how do you honor that heritage. How do you bring it forward to today's environment, even with the height of technology that we can use today? And heritage is basically your origin plus your history. It's how you came to be and everything else that's happened since then. So think about how you bring that heritage forward, how you honor that heritage and what you do. Because if you do anything that's antithetical to your heritage, to who you are at your core, well, that's when you'll get perceived as phony. In terms of being what you say you are, the easiest way to be perceived as phony, again, is to advertise something that you are not. And, and, and destinations do that all the time. Organizations do that all the time. Instead of advertising, which is a phoniness-generating machine, what you need to do is understand the primacy of place. You need to create places where people can experience who you are. That's what Lapland did. Create a place, even though it's a temporary pop-up place, where people can experience what Lapland is, is all about. What a place is, is a venue, whether it's physical, whether it's virtual, but a venue plus an event. An event is what happens in that place, what happens in that place over time. And whether you, you do it by creating a marketing experience elsewhere, or you do it in your own destinations, right, you need to understand that you are practicing placemaking. Right? You are place makers. That's what ur urban tourism needs to be. In our book on authenticity, we have this place making portfolio. I'm not going to go into the details of it or anything. I'm going to make one particular point is that as an urban tourist destination, what you want to become is an experience hub. What's an experience hub? An experience hub is a destination place that people want to experience in their lives a place where people go to be able to experience things. And that is the goal that you want, to become an experience hub. And you do that through placemaking. Placemaking was in fact coined by famed architect, now the late architect John Jerdy, uh, where he talked about placemaking as experience design. Right? It's experience design. And he says, what we do to be placemakers is we design time. Right, again, the pri think of how important time is. It's time well spent. You want to charge for time. You want to design time. But it's one of the big problems with urban tourism today is nobody's there helping consumers design their time. They're left with, here's thousands upon thousands of different options that you can do. Right, pick and choose among yourself, and their, their eyes glaze over. They don't know what to do. They don't know when, no, what order to do it in. You need to help them design time. One destination that I know of, not an urban one, but uh, in Hauts uh, de France, uh, where they talk about handbook experiences that you love. And what they do is they'll help you create your own personal travel itinerary. Based on your themes of what you're looking for, 
they'll say, okay, here are the experiences you can have. Here's the sequence of them. Here's the designing of time. And we need to do that more and more. We need to customize the place for each individual consumer. Customization is, in fact, key. Customization is how we discovered this progression of economic value. It's the antidote to commoditization. Right? As commoditization drags you down year after year, customization lifts you up. And, and you cannot help be di differentiated when you customize. So it turns goods into services and services into experiences. So you think about smart cities. Right? Smart cities is all about customization. Industry 4.0 as applies to urban environments is about customizing it to individuals, to everything that's going on, knowing what's going on. But it's not enough to be smart. Right? It's not enough to be smart. What's increasingly happened as we, we have smart products and smart cities and so forth is things that don't have intelligence in them, that don't have sensors in them, well, they're becoming dumb. Right? They're becoming dumb. We have dumb products. You think about uh, you put your hands in front of a faucet right, and the water doesn't come out because right, it doesn't have a sensor. You think dumb or it makes you feel dumb when that happens. Or in a city environment, you uh, stop at a stoplight and you wait there for 60 seconds and not a single car goes back. Right? Dumb because it doesn't have the intelligence. And what increasingly happens is it's making those dumb things appear stupid. Right? That they are in fact stupid. So we need to go from, you know, avoid being dumb and stupid, and, and we need to go from smart, though, to one more level, and that I call genius. That what Industry 4.0 applied to smart cities really should become is that the cities themselves become genius platforms, where you are a genius, where you anticipate, not just sense and respond. Give you an example of one genius platform, and obviously you can think about Alexa and Google Home and all those things. But in the tourist industry, Carnival Corporation, the cruise company, has created the Ocean Medallion program. And Ocean Medallion is an IoT device, it's just about the size of a coin here, that, that eventually as they roll it out, every guest will get one of these. And it allows them to identify who this guest is and what their preferences are and remember them. So that when you walk on the ship, you don't have to show your passport three or four times. When you walk there, you're on a crew compass, a tablet that every employee has. Up pops your picture and your name and that you're ocean ready, as they call it, that your passport's all ready. You can just walk on. So you just walk on the ship. When you get to your door, you just touch the doorknob and it opens because it knows who you are. And it can anticipate your needs. In fact, it could know that when you go onto the pool deck with your kids, your favorite drink, say, is an iced tea with no lemon. When you're in the bar with your buddies, it's a mojito. And when you're in the, the restaurant with your wife, it's a glass of Shiraz. Right? Understanding what do you want to do now? What market are you in at the moment? And it's going to revolutionize, and we need to turn cities into these same sort of genius platforms. And what it is, basically, is you think about how it allows you to more and more individualize your offering to individual visitors and even to citizens, of course, as well. So that you don't just sense and respond, but you anticipate. And how do you do that? You do that by understanding the entire digital context, by scooping up all of the data about what's going on in your city and who this individual living, breathing customer is. And it allows you to vastly multiply what you can do for them and design their time. Right? Dumb products, you know, they can get the job done that a, cons that a customer wants. Stupid products, they just get in the way. Smart products, well, they go beyond that original job to do more and more. But what genius platforms do is they basically turn skills into superpowers. That you treat your consumers, your visitors, like they are, have superpowers because you enable them to design everything for themselves and around themselves. And that's where we are going. But there's one more level. There's one more thing I want to talk about. Vogue, a year ago, had a, 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 a article where they talked about why transformative travel will be the travel trend of 2017. And that's absolutely wrong. It's not the travel trend of 2017. It's the travel trend now and to forever. That in fact, there's one more economic offering after experiences, because experiences can be commoditized as well. 
It's the been there, done that effect. When people are saying been there, done that about your tourist destination, it's becoming a commodity. But with this heuristic of customization as the antidote to commoditization, what happens when you customize the experience? What happens when you design an experience that's so appropriate for this particular visitor, that's exactly the experience that they need at this moment in time? Then you can't help but turn into what we often call a life-transforming experience, an experience that changes us in some way, and that I call a transformation. A transformation is the fifth and final economic offering in this progression of economic value. We're using experiences as the raw material to guide people to change, and that is the future of urban tourism. That it's not just that you leave them with the great experience, not just with time well spent, but in fact that it becomes time well invested. That they value the time they spend with you because of a difference it makes in their own lives. Whether it's in their education, whether it's in their worldview, whether it's in the relationship that they have with their kids or with their spouse, whatever it might be, right, where you're helping them achieve their own aspirations. Uh, the psychologist Jeffrey Kotler created this book, The Travel That Can Change Your Life, How to Create a Transformative Experience. And I actually don't recommend this book. It's a lot of psychobabble in that. But I, what I recommend it for is the basic point. We as human beings are most open to change when we travel. So there are tremendous opportunities for transformative travel to help people change through the travel environments that they go. So there's a Transformation Travel Council, for example, that's all about this and creating platforms for people to transform while they change. Most of it is around not urban but wilderness sort of environments. You see things like Visit Sweden created this, this transformational weekend program where they put people in this house, open air, I mean, it's glass, uh, but you see the environment for a weekend, and they found that it changed them, that, their, that their, their heartbeat actually went down 9% on average, that their stress levels went down 70% on average in spending just a weekend here. It transformed their health, their well-being. We need to do the same in urban environments as well. Because Skiff asked this question in, in, of over 500 consumers, and they found that, uh, that over 50% of them graded tr the importance of transformative travel a 7 to 10. You can see the great shift there, that people are looking for transformation today, that they don't just want the same old experience. They don't want to go back the same person. They want to go back a new person. And what that is is about understanding their aspirations, their individual aspirations. Where are they today? What do they want to become? And if you can understand the aspirations of individual visitors, there's no greater value you can provide than to help somebody achieve his aspirations. So let me close then by saying that as urban tourism destinations, you can stay in the, the, the safety of past practices and keep on doing the same things you've always been doing. Well, then mark my words, you'll be commoditized. Or you can shift up this progression of economic value to staging experiences, even charging for it. And then even going beyond that to guiding transformations, to getting into transformative travel for each one of your individual visitors. And then you will be rewarded as a, as a destination. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pine, uh, for that very passionate and insightful keynote speech. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that everyone could now use a cup of coffee. We're going to have a coffee break for 30 minutes. Uh, the high-level panel will resume at uh, 20 past 11. Uh, we are a little bit behind schedule, so uh, it would be much appreciated if you could return uh, to your seats uh, promptly at uh, 11.20. Uh, coffee and refreshments are prepared outside in the lobby. Uh, please enjoy the coffee break. Thank you.